the aftermath of the hyena attack, Matthias's senses are buzzing. The confidence that pulses in his heart is matched by his heightened awareness of the perils lurking around every bend. He has taken a few superficial wounds, but fortunately nothing that caused him more than temporary pain and exertion. Despite his successes thus far, he remains keenly aware that in many situations, things could have gone far worse. As he is contemplating exploring the nearby archways, another hyena comes into view. It chases a lizard along the stony ground, and the little critter darts into a patch of weeds. The hyena shoves its snout into the grassy vegetation, snaps once, twice, and pulls out with the lizard trapped in its jaws. It devours the tiny meal and sniffs about the same area. Meanwhile, Matthias watches from the cover of a nearby archway passage. The hyena looks to be an adolescent or young adult. Its markings are somewhat different from the cackle of three that the warrior just dispatched. The beast searches about for a couple minutes, oblivious to the human. It then pads along westward through the corridor. A few different thoughts cross Matthias's mind. The one that interests him the most is to seek out where it is that the younger hyena came from. He goes to where he first spotted it, in the corner bend of the Great Corridor. The ground is hard stone, and though it has a film of grit and grime in many places, the hyena tracks are difficult to follow. Matthias comes to what he believes is the hyena's den, only to find no sign of hyenas or anything of interest. In his search, he inadvertently startles a viper. He notices the poisonous snake, and it does not catch him unawares. The snake is about two feet in length. It has a pale beige coloration with dark brown to black bands on its scales. What look like two tiny horns sprout from above its nostrils. It rears and strikes. It hits Matthias' thigh area, but its fangs do not penetrate his leathers. He returns the attack. The area is too cramped for a proper glaive swing. He jerks the blade downward onto the snake's body, then drives in with his weight, chopping the tiny reptile in two. Matthias backs out of the musty den, thankful to have not been struck by the venomous snake. One wrong turn in this place can mean death. It was a close brush with the deadly fangs of the viper. Fortunately for the young adventurer, his tracking amounted to only some wasted time. The sun is still shining brightly in the sky above, but it is certainly a good few hours past noonday by now. When night falls, he plans to return to the sanctuary chamber that Epsilon Nykta offered after he completed the flame sconce puzzle. He goes to the first archway passage and enters the chamber beyond. To the north and east in this chamber are open archways. The southern wall has a stone slab that is shut. In the center of the room is a huge bronzen dais with four domes of thick glass atop it. Approaching Matthias from the dais is the serpent guard Bastus from the Fane of the Guardians. He walks up to the young man. Well, you have reached farther than some neophyte. I believe that. I see that you have found a respectable weapon. Bastus gives a slight nod to the glaive that Matthias holds, which is not terribly different from his own. I've found many things so far. You will need it. The trials hold more danger than you realize, boy. Matthias's nerves sizzle. An uncomfortable sensation crawls over his skin. The other serpent guard, Kreeth, had said that the scaled oracle's gaze would be upon the neophyte at all times. But could she see inside of this enclosed room? Matthias takes a step backward, closer to the opening behind him. I will find a way to overcome all the dangers in this place. You will perish. The tongue of truth marked you as unworthy. The viper that Bastus had released in the fane indeed had gone to bite Matthias. But the eagle killed the snake. I was born under the seventh star, Bastus. I believe the eagle to be a spirit sent to protect me. 
There are many birds in the labyrinth. It was pure luck. The seventh star is meaningless. The only god you should concern yourself with is the serpent, and he has decreed your doom. Accept this, and he will take you into his coils instead of his belly. Matthias takes another step backward, then another. Defeating three hyenas in combat was precarious enough, but facing a serpent guard seems another thing altogether. Your counterpart, Kreeth, disagreed with you, and I sense that you value his word. We will see what this all means soon enough. I implore you, be patient. You do not know Kreeth, and you do not know me. Do not speak to me of patience. I am a guardian of the Fane and the Trials. I have stood my post in steadfastness for decades upon decades. Bastus grips the haft of his polearm. Is he readying to strike? Matthias picks up the pace and reaches the warm sunlight of the corridor. I can taste your fear. The rat cannot escape the jaws of the serpent forever. Bastus does not give chase, but rather about faces, heaves open the stony slab on the southern wall, and moves out of sight. His metallic footsteps fade away. The Ikoriite's words weigh heavily upon Matthias. I've never seen such conviction, or perhaps fanaticism. Even Tabermon the Haruspex, the priest of his own garden city, falls short of this extreme level of fervor. But what exactly is Bastus doing? Bastus seems highly oriented towards duty and stricture. He had intended to kill Matthias and the Thane after the eagle had snatched away the snake, but Kreeth had given him pause. He then took upon himself the task of finding an egg to hatch a new tongue of truth. In this most recent interaction, Matthias' mentioning of Kreeth held Bastus back. It seems that Bastus is looking for some sign before he continues with what he believes is his duty, slaying the neophyte. Perhaps he is waiting for the right moment or the right place. Bastus will not attack purely out of want or whim. It needs to be formalized. It needs to be ordered by something higher than himself. He needs something greater than his word against his counterparts. And when he finds it, he will hesitate no more. Matthias feels certain that Bastus has gone away. He returns to the center of the chamber and looks around. The metal dais displays four glass domes affixed to its top. They are made of thick glass, and within them swirl gases. Each container has an activator and a symbol struck in the bronze of the dais surface. The ceiling of the room bears a resemblance to the organ chamber ceiling. It is composed of layers of concentric hollow squares that protrude downward. Also in the room, in one of the corners, is another metallic locker. Matthias notices nothing else that seems noteworthy in this room. Believing the locker to be safe, he opens it. From the bronze and coffer, he takes a battle axe with a sheath. It is a sturdy weapon, more familiar to him than the glaive, though the reach of the glaive is an advantage, and he is certain that he will get more accustomed to it soon enough. He stows the battle axe, glad for the find, but wishing that he would have found something to increase his defenses. I need some real armor or a shield. What I'm wearing is little more than clothing. He marvels whenever he sees the Serpent Guard's fantastic metal plating, and he also sweats at the thought of fighting an opponent so well armored. Now, what is this contraption? Matthias comes to the dais. He lifts himself onto the first level of the platform to study the symbols labeling each of the four gas containers. They are clearly alchemical symbols, but what they mean is a mystery to the neophyte. His knowledge in this area is quite limited. He is very hesitant to press any of the activators. Unsure about the current chamber, Matthias decides to look into the next room. He takes a short passageway southward which leads to an arched opening at the other end. When he peers in, he sees that it is somewhat similar to the prior room in architecture, slightly larger. 
To the east is an open archway that he knows leads back out into the great corridor. To the west are large iron double doors. In the center of the chamber is a collapsed stone obelisk that has broken into a few big chunks. Lying beneath the heavy stones is a diorthocans. One of its hands has tools extruded and the other fingers. Ho oh, there! Can you hear me? The construct struggles to communicate. Its arms and hands make weak movements. The base of its body and its legs are trapped under the collapse. 